Okay, let's get this started. Just checking my connection. I am now live. Good afternoon, everyone. BC here. Hope everything is well, and thank you for joining us on another exciting episode of the BC Moto Tech Tuesday. Instead of being in the back garage where it's pretty warm, I am now here in our waiting room, which is pretty cool, very comfortable. The air conditioning is on. Hello, Riley. Thanks for joining us. And for those of you on YouTube, thank you once again. This is an interaction where I have people write in some questions and even ask live on Instagram and we do this every Tuesday on the Bisamoto IG feed at 12 Pacific 3 p.m. Eastern. Hello Alfie, good seeing you. Hello Renault, hello Kaylee. Levin, hello Sam, good seeing you as well. Hello Jay. Wow Purple Rain, thank you for joining us. I like your uh, screen name there. Hello AJ, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Hey Shell, how are you? Good afternoon. Hello Levin. Good afternoon, good seeing you guys, and thank you so much. Once again, I'm here in my waiting room. We have this pretty cool video from the Cup uh, uh, Racing out in the UK um, next to this beautiful display of the uh, Carbon Revolution wheel and some cool t-shirts in the rear as well. Very nice. And of course, how are we doing, Ari, so far? This one is it it's not. It's not connecting. Oh, that's weird. I'm having some weird difficulty here. So give me a second. Let me turn on this camera so that the people on YouTube can see us properly. Hello, Flat6, good seeing you. Hello, Kenny. Hello, FedEx, good seeing you. Okay, let's try again. How is it still misbehaving? Okay, now it's done. Uh, it's still recording. It's still recording, okay. So it looks like we're good, except my podcasting is misbehaving, which is really strange. So I use this other phone to record the podcasts live so that I can play back on iTunes and Anchor and public radio and all that good stuff. Um, fast and die, I would definitely check that out because I want to be involved with that, definitely. You know, Thank you so much for the kind words on t-shirts. And we have this one right here as well, which I think we're out of extra large, but uh, we will have those probably next week. Um, hello from Japan, good seeing you. I am well, JD, I'm good seeing you. Of course, we have Ari right here. There you go, hello. she's waving. There's Ari right there. And we are going to answer all your questions and have a great time this afternoon. So, without further ado, Ari, what do we have so far? Make sure that, oh, my anchor is still messing up. What should I do about this? No podcast this week. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send feedback. I'm going to try and, I should probably disable this and try and bring it back up. Yeah. Um, send that, and I'm going to try and uh, uninstall this app. Okay. So it's, it's just an app on installation that I have to do. Oh, Alfie says, hello, Hi, Ari. It's pretty nice. And then I'll go back in and I'll activate again the anchor so that we can have a podcast so you guys can listen at the convenience of your home when you're working out, in the gym, walking your dogs, whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, I tried rebooting Kenny so many times and still misbehaving so I'm going to uninstall and then reinstall it. So as we're doing that, I hope you guys are doing well. hope you had a great weekend. We had a fantastic time. Last week was a very busy week for us here. We were filming and other kind of crazy stuff. Um, Love is Extinct is asking if there are any plans for a 356 Beaster in the future. So if you re may remember on some of the, uh, on one of the Busy Motor Tech Tuesdays, we had it at the beautiful facility of Rod Emery at Emery Motorsports. And we get along very well, so don't be surprised to see a beautiful Rod Emery Busy Motor combination. Well, you have all the crazy forward thinking technology from Busy Motor and a beautiful, classic, gorgeous 356 Beaster combined together. So you can expect to see that very, very soon. Okay, so on my Type R, can't talk about that. On the EF wagon, coming up very slowly. This week we're removing the factory engine. And it's actually an automatic D15 that's coming out. And we are in talks with getting a very proper engine in there. So it has to go to paint after we take out the engine and remove the interior, which should happen this week. You know, um, AJ hey, says hey. Uh, some people have static noise. Let me know if you guys have a lot of static noise. Nathan says no, that he hears clearly. Rich is, says we're okay. So I think so we're okay. Maybe um, you may have to come out and come back in, AJ. It sounds fine. It sounds good? Yeah, Ari just checked hers. It sounds good as well. Um, so, great question and great answer for you, hopefully. And I'm going to go back in here and try and add what we took off a moment ago. So I'm going to go to apps here. I'm going to go to the Play Store. And I'm going to add Anchor back in. 
So hang with me guys, I appreciate your your patience during this. Because the great thing about this is I understand that video is great. Living, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. It's, it's possible, AJ. Um, video is great, interaction like this live is great, but I know that your time is very valuable and con convenience is extremely important as well. So I want to be able to give all of you the opportunity to um, easily listen to this interaction later on at your convenience, which is pretty good. And we can only have it up here on Instagram for 24 hours, but I want it to be very, very nice for you. Yes, I am ready to go back to Button Willow. My clients aren't, meaning I have so much work to do here. It would be very difficult for me to go soon, but I'm hoping to go on the 7th. I'm waiting for a vehicle from one of our manufacturer partners, but um, nothing has come yet, so I don't know what the deal is. Um, this phone is really misbehaving. My Google Play is just turning and turning and turning and turning. Android. Android. <laughs> Android problems. Maybe I should try rebooting this as well. I'm going to restart that. And I won't let this hold us back. Let's just go ahead and continue. I'll come back in. So, Ari, what's the first question we have for our friends this afternoon? We are going to start with the question from Giants Rider 82. Okay, Giant Rider 82. Hopefully you guys can hear Ari. I have been running 91 ethanol free in my FA5. Okay. Is it worth the extra few bucks to run it over regular 93 with the ethanol added? What are the pros and cons? So uh, it's very interesting that you're able to get access to 91 that's ethanol free because it's mandated nowadays here in the US to have at least 10% of ethanol. It, it helps with anti neck properties, it helps with cooling as well, and it does tend to extend the capabilities of an engine very nicely and increase the volume of gasoline that we use in a very cost-effective manner. So if you're finding some 91 that's ethanol free, that's pretty interesting. Or maybe you do have ethanol and you don't quite know that. But as I mentioned last year, um, that being said, oh, not last year, but last session, if your engine is optimized for 91, there's no advantage in going to a higher octane because the ignition timing will be optimized for that, for the perfect burn and the perfect work to happen. If you go up to a 93, you can many times, because the fuel burns slower, or they say there's no ethanol and shell gas in Canada. That's good to know. That's very interesting. But if you go to 93 and you're optimized for 91, you will not see any power gains. If anything, sometimes you will see a power loss because the fuel burns slower. The ideal ignition timing is not for optimal work on the piston dome with combustion, and you can actually hurt things um, in terms of power. You won't hurt anything in terms of making your engine less reliable, but you just may not make the power or see no power whatsoever. Now, if your vehicle has an optimization for 93 with a tune or from the factory, and many a times those manufacturers or tuners put in a knock sensitive capability so that if you're 91, the ECU can automatically retard timing and add fuel to keep it safe, then you will see power gains. But if it's 91 optimized, you will not. My advice would be, if you're going to 93 and want access to that, tune your vehicle for that and you'll have a great time. You'll see some nice power gains with your boosted or NA, which is pretty nice. Um, Raymond, I do give advice on any parts. Um, I don't sell everything here at Bisimoto, and that's why these, section, these sessions uh, are very good. Even now we just talk about fuel. I don't sell fuel here at Bisimoto, but I do give advice on it. So wherever you need in, insight or help with parts, I'll be more than happy to assist you. And if it's something where I feel ideal for you to go to a manufacturer, I will advise that as well, which is pretty nice, you know? That's a very nice range you have there, Greg. You guys are very fortunate. Um, here we have 91, 87, and 89, and then very close to our facility here we have access to some pump E85, which is fantastic, by the way. Hello, Sarah. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Hello, Thiago. Thank you so much. Green from Brazil as well. Thank you so much. Okay, what else do we have, Ari? We've got an AJ question. AJ is here. While Ari's asking that question, I'll try and see if I can get our um, podcasting program up and running again. When building an engine from scratch with no aftermarket support, how many test engines do you tend to go through before finally settling on the finished product? That's a great question, AJ. So AJ knows that I'm very crazy here and that we tend to play around a lot with engines that have no aftermarket support. And that being said, we have to develop products from scratch and be able to do it reliably um, in terms of everything from internal combustion engines to anything that's being added to engine management solutions. Now. AJ, I'm very fortunate because years ago I had the opportunity to play around with a lot of engines and do a lot of experimentation. And the engine concepts are very similar. If you look at a rod design, whether it's an I-beam or an H-beam, there are certain stressors that exist in those rods. And if you're looking for a certain horsepower rating per cylinder, years ago was a time when I had some failure analysis to where I know what works and what does not. So when it comes to engine design, 
with the sleeving, rods, pistons, the most critical components that take a lot of abuse. We've already done that homework before. So fast forward to today, I can get a bespoke engine that's very unique and not have any challenges whatsoever. How do you know about that, Constructor? How do you know about that? Should I grab it? Yeah, I just really, I want to grab it just for you because I don't even, how does he even know that? That's kind of scary. Anyway, so that being said, um, we have opportunities where we have already done that engine in the background. So now it's a matter of pairing the data that we have with the engines that we're building. And it becomes very, very simple. The challenge is this. When we have an engine management solution with a unique combustion chamber design that needs a lot of attention. So nowadays we see smaller combustion chambers, different valve angles, different valve trains. So the challenge comes with the engine management integration, which is really interesting. Um, so that being said, I really don't go through many engines. I think the last engine that we did for a manufacturer, we went to through two power plants before we optimized it. And that had to do with how we stratified the fuel and how it was being utilized to create the power they wanted in an environment that was great for efficiency and endurance, particularly in lean burn. So that was, that was great. So, Chair, what he's talking about is this. Is, this is my, um, for those of you who don't know what this is, this is my do not judge me wig. So since I'm part of the Commonwealth, you can see this. This is the wig that I use when people judge me. <laughs> so that being said, as a judge back in Nigeria, uh, back in the UK, or into the Commonwealth, this is what people used to wear. And there's a really interesting thing that had to do with judging and so on and so forth. So Ari's here laughing. But anyway, I love it. so that's my wig that everyone's talking about. People are laughing. <laughs> so, and it's coming apart, which is pretty interesting. Everyone's laughing here. So you see me from time to time when people have a silly question that's judging. I will have my judge wig here and discuss it with you. Okay. People are saying no judging here. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, you're very, very clever. Anyway, so I hope that answers your question. We typically don't go through engines because nowadays we've done all the fair analysis with the major components and anything that's unique usually isn't a challenge except for integration with engine management solutions um, or exotic fuels or doing something very lean burn for a manufacturer. But the hard components, years ago, I used to go through engines like crazy doing fair analysis. We used to purposely blow up engines to see where they are and then back off 30%, which is pretty, pretty nice. Oh, they saw on Hedy's feet. She's been very naughty. But anyway, sounds good. So thank you so much, AJ, for that question. That's very, very good. And let's see if I can get our podcast open so you guys can listen to this afterwards. Even though so many people would have loved hearing AJ's question and the answer that was given to it, which is pretty cool. Um, no, we don't want to do that. I'm going to sign up with probably my Facebook. And let's do that and see if it signs me in to my account. So guys, bear with me. I think I am good. Go to my profile. I'm good there. Add a new segment. Let's record. Allow it to record. And we are recording. So we are good to go. And hopefully we have some stability here. Um, why would T-Bills ask, why would you build a fast, small car and why? Well, because weight is the enemy, enemy of performance. It's always advantageous to use a very small vehicle with a very potent engine to get the best of both worlds. Lower mass to accelerate and something that obviously looks very, very cool, which is nice. Um, have I started to call my daughter something neat for her first vehicle? Actually, I have. She has... My daughter is kind of crazy. She's really into cars quite a bit. And I remember for many, many years, she was into the Odyssey van, but now she's all about the Viper, which is pretty crazy. But she already tells me that she wants a pink 911. So don't be surprised if I build something really nice for her. You know, I'd love to do an Abarth build. Um, we're starting to develop our relationship with FCA, so you never know. That may come very soon. But thanks for suggesting that. First gen CRV. Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Honda's kind of pushing us away from doing a lot with the older vehicles um, and focusing on some of the newer platforms, which is nice. So Sunka is saying, hello, sir. Great actor, by the way, and we appreciate all that you do. Um, he says that uh, it's not a car question, but I'm one of the most positive people he's ever had the privilege of meeting in the car community. Where do I get this perspective? I would say my father. My father's been a very good uh, son, very good mentor for me. Very mo modest gentleman, very humble, and really taught me the benefits of hard work and staying focused and being good to people. So that's the reason why. But I appreciate that, sir. I look forward to doing something with you on the telly one of these days. Appreciate all your work and your talent. We love it so much. So that's so good. Um, how much can a stock head take? 
that depends on what you're talking about. Are you talking about boost pressure? Are you talking about horsepower potential? I don't quite understand your question, so I may have to get you to ask me that again. Um, thank you so much, Bass. Appreciate that. Yeah, you're right. All-wheel drive Civic is 2,300 pounds. Super is 3,600 pounds. Imagine putting a super engine in that all-wheel drive Civic. That would be the cat's meow. Okay, Ari, right. what are questions we have? A uh, question from Christian Joho. Christian Joho has a question. Let me check on this. We're still going here at Anchor, which is good. If you had to pick a favorite Porsche you built at BC oh. Moto, which one would it be and why? That's a tough question. He's asking which is the favorite Porsche I built here and why. Most likely it would be the Blue 911 that I posted up this morning on my feed because it's, it is the best, honestly, I'm not, it's almost like I'm tuning my own horn here. Maybe I am. It is the best sounding Porsche I've ever heard. That thing sounds like a jet. It's so awesome. So it's really fast, really, it scares people. It's comfortable for me, but for the journalists that have jumped in it, for people who have driven there, like this is the most terrifying thing ever. It's actually ridiculous. So it has to be the 76 911. It's just, it's just right there at the edge of control and lack of control, which is fantastic. And let's see. Recently, because of my experience with road racing, I would say it's the Boxman, the center seat Boxman. Uh, that Sam helped out with. It's really, really great and very balanced car and just like a go-kart on steroids. So it's a lot of fun. But it doesn't scare me yet. It doesn't scare people yet. But that's coming. <laughs> so maybe when it starts scaring people, it'd be, it'd be pretty nice. Um, Kier has a good, Kier's Hungry has a good question. What do I think is the best entry-level Porsche for someone a sub-20 bucket? Budget, not bucket, but budget. Wow, that's a great question. So I'd say the best sub-20 Probably the 9871 Cayman. That is a good all-round mid-engine, let's say the S, 3.4 liter, six-speed power plant, very nimble, has a lot of potential, and you can obtain that in the 20,000 range, in the, in, the, in the high teens, lower 2000, 20,000 range, which is pretty nice. Um, Edge is telling me to build an air-cooled diesel and put in a Porsche. Put it in a, build an air-cooled diesel and put in a Porsche. I, I think you mean, an air, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a very interesting comment. Um, there's another question I just saw that... that uh, oh, thank you so much, Constructive. Do I build... Andrew's asking, do I build quarter mile drag builds? It's so sad. No one even remembers my drag racing anymore. So, to answer your question, Andrew, my background is in drag racing. Even now, as a road racer, as I'm trying to get into that, I'm not a great road racer on the corners. I am... Um, I'm very slow in the corners. You can have a stock CRX and pass me in the corners. I'm not very good. I'm not... That confident yet even though my cars are putting out decent times it's because on the straightaways or semi straights I am I'm drag racing this thing and I'm just going crazy I'm comfortable with it where others may not be and then come to a corner I'm breaking early and getting into it too soon and kind of drifting out the corner so it's, it's really interesting but my background for years since 1994 has been drag racing and yes I do I do build quite a few drag cars and I have a few in house and you'll be seeing some more of my drag racing very soon, which is pretty nice because I'm trying to get a break for myself to be able to go out and have a blast with my, my stuff. Um, hello, Uncle Rico from El Paso. Thanks for joining us. Yes, this is a um, cup racing in the UK. It's like the uh, Porsche Cup in England. That's right behind me. My pleasure, Dina. Uh, builds coming out slowly but surely, folks. You missed it a little bit earlier on. The engine and interior is coming out this week. So we're getting to it and it's going to be so such an awesome one. Um, thank you so much, and I plan on being even a further beast. Thank you so much. Do I uh, do I do two chassis? No, I don't. You know, it's almost my thing, um, where uh, I, I take pride in building unibody cars and keeping it that way. So I understand the benefits of weight, but I also understand the benefits of clowning people with a unibody chassis. So my insight is the fastest unibody all motor period. The people who run low nines and try and eclipse the eight seconds are all at the front half or tube chassis or back half or something crazy. So I'm honored to have a stock windshield in my car on the inside and it being full unibody, which is pretty exciting, you know. Um, yeah, I can do that. It's kind of boring stuff and that Greg is asking, will I have a live stream of my shop working on cars? I'd love to. I can do that, but it's really boring. It's like watching paint dry. But what I could do is maybe some of the short stuff, maybe oil changes, um, uh, tuning session, something that won't take too long. And live streams are cut me off in an hour anyway. But to do a uh, engine build or install takes more than an hour. So, but I'll, I'll put up maybe the exciting stuff. That's a great suggestion. Um, Antoine is telling me to bring back my bleach blonde hair. Well, maybe I should do that. Bring it back. But 
My Porsche guys didn't like it. So when I was a crazy Honda guy, yes, I did all the time. But my Porsche people didn't like it. They kind of frowned on me. Just use the wig. I just use the wig. Here you go. How about this? This would be the closest thing to my bleach blonde hair. How's that? Look at it. Yeah. There you go. It's like Rick James almost. You did. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting what's going on here. Um, a K20 Porsche. Well, I've seen... See, are you judging me? No. Um, yes, I've considered a podcast with uh, Joe Rogan, and we talked about that a little bit when I was at Matt Faraz last week, which would be very nice, so we'll make that happen very soon. Yes! Lord BC the third. Yes, I am. Okay. So, all I need is my gavel, and I'll be good to go. <laughs> 15 years younger. <laughs> so funny. Um, let's see. Uh, the K20 Porsche, do I like them? I think it's very creative and very unique. Take this off. People are laughing too much now. Um, wow, this thing is shedding. Ugh. Anyway, for those of you who are on the podcast, I just put on a crazy wig um, that's reminiscent of the lords in, in, in England and the Commonwealth nations where barristers and lawyers and judges wear them, which is pretty interesting. Um, so I, to answer your question, Aston, I do appreciate the creativity. I understand the merging of, a, of an efficient engine, which the K20 is, with some modern technology, which the K20 has, and an older air-cooled Porsche. But I'm also a huge advocate of keeping marquees as they should exist together. So I'm the first one to put a water-cooled engine in a classic 911, but I usually stay with a Porsche. Uh, Front-wheel drive Porsche, ooh, that would be very, very difficult to integrate into a 911 chassis. Even more interesting to do. And I don't quite see the benefit of that. If you had an all-wheel drive platform, you, most of the components for the rear-wheel drive are a lot more robust. I don't quite understand the rationale of that. I don't just do things for the sake of doing them. Um, there's always a logical reason that's typically embedded in technology for me to do something crazy, like what I just spoke about before, a 911. I love the beauty of classic 911s, like my 76. And we have 77s back there, we have a um, 78 back there, we have an 80, 84, we have quite a few 911s. I love all the classic, beautiful lines. But I'm not a huge advocate of old school technology. I love newer technology. So I would put a water cooled Porsche engine with CAN bus and drive a wire into an older car. So it starts each time, it's very fast and fun and looks beautiful. So I'm, I'm doing that. Ah, so the support said uh, front wheel drive Porsche. Are they judging me? Maybe they are. Okay. So don't judge me. I don't want to build a front wheel drive Porsche. Okay. <laughs> anyway, this is going to get out of hand very soon, <laughs> which is pretty nice. Um, so, send the support. I have something coming to you. A couple of things coming to you. We'll talk soon. I'll give you a call, which is very, very nice. So, Ari's giving me that look. Look at Ari, guys. She's I'm giving me a look. She, you. She's judging me. Give me a look. <laughs> she wants me to answer some more questions because she's only asked one or two so far. Three. So, three. Okay. I'm, I'm losing count. So, Ari, next question. What do you have? Chuck Norris, 1320. Chuck Norris. I can't believe Chuck Norris is in my feed. Anyway, what does Chuck Norris want, want to know? He wants to know what brand turbos do you have on the blue 911? So I have Turbonetics. I have uh, Turbonetics turbochargers, which were the one on the 911 is my third iteration. The first one, I had 61, 62's billets, which almost killed me. I was terrified driving that. Then I went a little bit smaller to, um, and, oh, I'm sorry, I went 64, 65. That's what I had initially. Ridiculous. I almost killed myself. Then I sat at 61, 62 for a while. It was just a little laggy. Then I went now to the 57, 58s, which are perfect. So the 57, 58, do you know I gained 300 horsepower at 5,000 RPMs just because of spool? So it was smaller, but spools quicker and sounds so good. It's perfect. Perfect, 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 perfect. Um, VICWP, Vic WP is asking the biggest lesson I learned in my years of tuning, um, the importance of knock. So... It's so important that nowadays I'm almost even leery. I'm pretty much leery of tuning engine management solutions that don't have knock capability in me drawing a unique knock curve and putting together a knock protocol. Um, it's extremely, it's the biggest lesson that if you don't pay attention to pre-ignition, especially in the days of high boost, high compression engines, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, what suspension am I running on the 76930? I built that car as my first Porsche, so we had some custom BC motor coilovers that we had made. And it was in a partnership with Eibach, and uh, I think I may have a couple more sets left over that I want to experiment with. Which I may use on some cars, but if you need some, I can help you with it. No problem. Uh, B, K, or A series. You don't know what to choose? Cam King, by far, K. The K series head flows better than all those, 
and has a lot more potentials. Um, so AJ Thompson, I did. Now here's the thing. The challenge wasn't the amount of power that happened in Boost, it's the delivery. So when I drove the 911, where it shut down my dyno, so it had to be over 1100 horsepower, when I floored it, I didn't feel anything. I'm in first, second, I'm in third gear, and I'm brrr, and nothing is happening, and then like that, front end comes up, I'm heading for a tree. The delivery was not comfortable. Anti-lagging would make it worse. Now, if it's a full drag car, that's cool, but it's something I was driving on the street, it was really scary. It really was, you know? Yes, F-Series for life. I, I, I love the F-Series. You know, you know me. You know me. I think I put some very good questions here. Oh, my God. You know, one day, Ari, we should just do live questions because so many come in. So I'm, I'm so I'm so scared that if I do that, we're going to have a full session, which would be good. Any tricks in making a stout D15 B2 is what the grape drink is asking. Grape, grape, grape. With a ZC head, has only been a hundred minutes since, but not following you for ages. So, I'm a huge advocate of D series. Um, we have the most powerful D series on the planet, and A that's been done here. We had the most powerful uh, D series boosted here in the facility, and then we were eclipsed by our partners who still use our parts to create that, but with a bigger turbo. So that being said, when it comes to D series performance, this is the place. The D15 B2, the challenge is there's not much aftermarket support. So you may have a little difficult time finding rods. We have access to those, but you can do that. But it's pretty straightforward. D15 B2, all you have to do is remove that little restrictor in the bottom where that feeds the head, putting a VTEC head, it bolts on, same bore spacing, same head stud facing, everything the same, bolts on, no problem whatsoever. And I actually like the bottom end of the D15 B2, which is pretty nice. But you definitely want to get the right pistons because the notches and the valves are not the same. Okay, so I hope that helps. And if you need help with piston designs, we will be more than happy to assist you. ATS Des asks, what was the biggest challenge in the center drive Boxster? Let's see. I would say, ah, oh, people judging me. There you go. <laughs> no, I'm never going to get this right. People judging me is the biggest challenge I have with that. So here we go. People judging me. Okay, there you go. That was the biggest challenge I had. The team, Duran, Sam and I had a great time building that car and it was fantastic. But I didn't make it a secret that we had to figure out all the bugs and take it to the track multiple times to figure it out. But people expected me to hit the ground running and breaking records and going crazy. It doesn't happen like that, guys. To be honest with you, you have to figure things out. And I wanted to do it in the public eye so you guys can see how interesting or difficult or easy it could be to work in a piecewise approach. I had people talking about the paint on it, people talking about the wheel spacing, even though we're playing with different kinds of uh, spacing for the wheels, for different track fitments, uh, different wheel size, tire compounds, um, size of the tanks. We did uh, drip tanks for the turbos. So many things. Even I have a smaller engine in there just to figure the chassis out. So it is a work in progress, but it's really interesting. The most difficult thing were people, certain people, not everyone, a lot of you liked it, but people criticizing it, which is quite sad, even though I'm here to educate and show people how great it could be to build a wonderful project and have a lot of fun, which is pretty nice. Um, would I ever hit the streets again? Well, if you mean street racing, no, it's very bad. I was very naughty in the late 90s, early 2000s. I won't do that again. It's just not worth it. I'd rather go to a proper track in a sanctioned event. Oh, my pleasure, Sarah. You're very kind. I appreciate that. 550 EcoBoost. I haven't had that much experience with it, not that much. So I don't have much insight on that. So please forgive me. Um, thoughts on the Sharkworks 4.9, 4.1 upgrade, potential beyond they're doing for a street setup. I love what Alex Sharkworks is doing. He's doing a great job with those engines and showing reliability with a lot of power. And of course you can have more, especially if you play with different fuels and you can push the envelope. But I know for both Alex and I, reliability is key. So I'm very happy with the power level where it is now. But you can eke a little bit more if you go flex fuel and run an E85, which is pretty nice. So there's still some good opportunity in there. Do you want any secret weapon to us? You know, of course, of course, very good secret weapon. Um, only uh, that car rock. Thank you so much, AJS. I appreciate that. Thank you, Sam. That's so kind. Okay. Um, yes, we did that, but I didn't like how it worked. So I didn't really finish working on that car because to make the 900 horsepower AJ, the Turbo was really large, it was 76, and I did, it wasn't a driver. Um, I'll be the first to admit that Mustang was a dyno queen. It made the power numbers, but I think in 1,000 RPMs, it had a 600 horsepower jump. It was a horrible chart. I didn't like driving that car at all, so I'm not, I wasn't pleased with it. It's one of the cars that I just wasn't pleased with, and I'll be the first to admit that. 
We can show the potential what you can do horsepower-wise with the engine, but running a 76 turbo on a small EcoBoost engine is not, is not the way to go. And I didn't want to spend more time on that platform. It just wasn't that exciting for me, you know. Um, I didn't have access to that, and we didn't have much time, AJ, so I, would, I didn't explore that. And even with a 6466, you know, those head ports on the EcoBoost Mustang are not very generous. So I don't know how or if I'd be able to push it that well to get that power with that smaller turbo. I don't know. Um, the turbocharger has the capability of pushing air into an engine, but how well the air ingested by the, by the head can occur is a huge component of power production, which is pretty interesting. Um, of course, I think good. When done right, twin charges are the way to go. It gives you the benefits of supercharging and turbocharging. So yes, it is worth the complexity when done right. If you make it complex to where it's rubbish, it will be rubbish. If you do a good job, it will be a great application and a lot of experience where you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have the, linear, the linearity of a supercharger and the big horsepower opportunity of a turbo. And I have to ask Ari to give me more questions. Um, this channel is just a feed um, that I got uh, from a video from the UK. So I attend the Autosport show every year and Porsche has a very nice booth. And if you go to Porsche's booth, they typically give out these pretty cool uh, videos to select individuals. So this is a recent cup uh, video that's playing that I already put on this morning that came from Porsche in the UK. It's pretty nice. No, 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 no. What's, what's, no, no, no. What's wrong, AJ? No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't, Boost Boys Odyssey is greater than BC. I don't even know what that means. Oh, Are no, you judging me? No, they're not. I see. Ari said, no, they're not. I, I have heard. no idea what we're talking about. But this is it. So, someone's Odyssey is better than mine. Do you know the okay. Beast Odyssey where we had, uh, we built everything from scratch and now there's a Hot Wheels made of it? I'm not, I'm not sure. If it is greater than good, that means we have more artists being built. But I have no idea what you're talking about. Right, CD5. CD5 is our court guy, so it should be our family, which is pretty interesting. Um, well, I did good. We've done some stuff for customers. We've had the opportunity to do something with customers. Um, a lot of tuning, a lot of ex exhaust design, so on and so forth. But it wasn't my car, so I didn't go crazy. And this was with a five-valve head, which is pretty interesting. We've had quite a few of those. Um, Let's see. Oh, you know what? The grape drink, then turbocharging is the way to get. It gives you much more power uh, for cost and much more power per displacement, which is pretty nice. Um, <laughs> listening to shower, I should judge it. That's so funny. You know. Okay. Hello, Rin Kara. Good seeing you. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Okay. Ari, question. What do we have? AJ question. AJ question. Since he said in Matt Farah's podcast yes. that you'd only just scratch the surface with the f 22 eight. That's engine, true. What changes and improvements would could you make? And what power would you expect to see NA or Boosted? Okay, Boosted is ridiculous. We can have an opportunity to do wonderful things. Um, I hope you didn't say an 800 horsepower car is better than 1,000. That doesn't make any sense at all. Riley, are you starting trouble here? That's very funny. Anyway, um, back to AJ's question. Yes, I haven't. So bear in mind that we built that F22A engine as a proof of concept. And to show that we can take any engine especially one that's unloved, and create good, reliable power with it. In doing so, there were a lot of compromises in place because I was trying to get to market relatively quickly and show the potential without dragging on for a long time. So one example is exhaust manifold. The header I have on there is a very archaic design, functional in terms of dimensions, but I haven't played around much with more than changing the venturis in the collector. So that being said, there's huge opportunity in the exhaust system alone. It's the same exhaust I had when the car was put together in 2005, 2006. Secondly, induction. Um, I have not explored significant induction changes in terms of cross-section area and taper. There's power potential there. Camshafts, I have left a lot of power on the table with camshafts as well. The one bad thing about single cam is that you have to grind in lobe separation. You cannot adjust the cam of intake and exhaust independently. So that being said, that's a limitation there as well. And last but not least, the caloric content of fuel. Um, I've always been a big ethanol guy, once in a while using methanol, but there are methanols that have olefins and, and oxygenase added to them, and I've not played with that at all. So, to quantify that, I think we have another 30, maybe 40 wheel horsepower in that engine, which can do wonders in terms of speed. And, oh, one last thing, displacement. Um, 
from what I understand, even recently, some K-series guys are running as big as 110, 112, 115 stroke uh, millimeters, that is. I haven't even gone anywhere near that. So what if I did something like that? What if I built an F-22 that was a 2.7 or 2.8? How much faster will we go? There's so much opportunity there, which is pretty nice. So I'm pretty excited, you know? Um, so I know you build SEMA, but what are builds ever entered in the battle of the builders prior portion of the show? Yes, so the very first battle of the builders, my 888 horsepower um, Sonata, yes, I built a roll race Sonata for Hyundai, which made 800 horsepower, more than a Hellcat, which is pretty interesting. And then my blue Porsche 911 was both in the Battle of Builders, and we got to the top 10. So if you go back to the very first one, you'll see where Sam Dew from Super Street fame and the other judges went around and, and evaluated my cause. So yes, I have. I've been there. We placed fairly well, which is pretty, pretty nice. Very honored to see, to see part of that. Okay. So... That being said, um, adding good, would I consider building a one-to-one -one power racial car? What car would I choose? Um, I would love to, and it would be a Caterham. That would be awesome. That would be fantastic, but scary to drive. So good question, adding good. Very nice. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. A uh, question from Sam Urkel. Sam Urkel? <laughs> These names. Sam, Sam Urkel, Urkel has a question. Okay, Sam Urkel, what do you have? I got a very well-maintained 99 Accord with an F23A and 5-speed. Okay. Would it make sense to do intake? head and exhaust work to add a little pep to it or would I just be waiting to damage my block? No, no, no. That's a very good process um, to be able to make power. You want to do intake head and exhaust. That helps tremendously. And your factory ECU will even compensate for the slight, slight changes there. And if you wanted the optimal and efficiency, then yes, you want to tune it. But no, that won't help. That won't hurt you. It would help, especially when done properly. It's when you cut corners or choose improper components is when you start having problems. But no, that's a good way to go. So thank you for asking that question. Yes, Ari? Another AJ question. AJ, one Since more. Since you said your blue 911 shown in the video scared you when you first put it together. Sure did. Would you consider converting it to all-wheel drive in order to render the car less scary and more drivable due to the fundamentally flawed chassis and cranking up the power to the limits of the engine? So that's a great question, and, and we may address that before. Um, the way that the older 911's chassis exist, it will be very invasive to go all drive. You can, but you would be better off starting with a 964 C4, which is already set up for all wheel drive. Um, that would be much better. But once again, the challenge wasn't the fact that it wasn't all wheel drive. My front wheels came off the ground. Being that it's a real wheel drive, rear engine platform, with a lot of power where the power came on very rapidly, that was a challenge. So now that it's a little bit more linear, it's a lot more fun. And I can still make that power, but even at 850 wheel in a 2400 chassis in terms of weight, 2400 pound, it scares a lot of people, you know. So that being said, there's more opportunity there, even with the 58 millimeter turbos. I can push it to 1000 if I push it, push it. But it's really comfortable at this point, so I hope that helps. Um, you said I can't, you can't talk about your Type R, but is there an industry race for the highest horsepower yet? Yes, there is constructive. And um, here's a challenge with the Type R. Great platform, drives beautifully. My experience with American Honda when they flew us out to the Homestead Raceway in, in Miami, and we had an opportunity to drive six different ones, including the SI in between, we found out very quickly that they, the car needed more power, even though it's very balanced. And the challenge is this, the mechanical pump. So the mechanical pump is what limits its power potential when using E85. Um, it limits the potential in terms of RPM. Um, we've seen bulletins from Bosch who makes the uh, mechanical pumps where if you rev it past 7400, you get a valve float and failure of the mechanical pump. And that's critical to the success of that engine for fueling. So I feel that the next big step for that engine would be to find a high output mechanical pump replacement, um, which would be better than retrofitting port injection. Putting port injection will solve all of that, but to make it more appealing to the masses, I believe that there's more of a run or a venture to have a more efficient pump, mechanical pump on the head, which is pretty nice. Um, so, Flat6 Chris is asking how much the boxer is weighing at the moment. 2550 is what it weighs right now. Extremely balanced, very, very balanced. So I hope that answers your question properly. Thank you so much, Fabian. Thank you so much. Um, EJ6 says, I always hear that Botons barely do anything to a stock D-Series. That's not true. <laughs> it does quite a bit. Um, headers give a ni very nice uh, bump to it. On the Y7, camshafts are huge. Um, the intake manifold is okay. ITBs help tremendously as well. 
Um, oil even gives you, the pure oil that we sell even helps give you some good power. I think I've seen 34 horsepower there. There are opportunities for the D. Yeah, that's not true. Um, yeah, if you buy rubbish bolt-ons, then yes, you will make power. But with proper, proper components, you can make some good power, by all means. That's been my experience. You know, you just, just don't stop. Keep going. You can put the wrong components and lose power from factory. But with the right components, yes, you can make power. Okay? Thank you so much, Adam. Good seeing you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Okay, what else do we have, Ari? Question from Gabriel Abrantes. Gabriel Abrantes has a question. Ever thought of doing a build with a dog leg gearbox? So, dog leg gearbox. So, I think he means that dog engagement, and we have. My insight has dogs welded onto factory gears, courtesy of our friends from Hausman. And the 2012 Civic has uh, straight cut gears uh, in a dog box. Uh, courtesy of Quaif, and so does the pink 77911 with the GT2 engine. So yes, we've had it. It does great things for positive engagement shifts and for shorter elapsed times based upon quick shifting, which is pretty nice. And keeping you in a power band as well. Hello, Irwins. Thank you for joining us. BB6, must be you have a prelude, so thanks for joining us this afternoon. Hello, Teco. Hello, Peter. Greetings, EJ. Hello, Wade. Good for joining us today. Appreciate that. And what else do we have, Ari? Another question from AJ. AJ! I love your questions, by the way. He's Thank you so much. Today. He's on a roll. Are do we you, doing? We're doing good here. Okay. Do you do some sort of financial deal for customers who may not have the cash in the bank? Well, we do accept credit cards. Um, we don't have, we're not partnered with any uh, financial companies. But, you know, we haven't really had that inquiry. If, if people have a hard time and need some kind of financing, we'd be more than happy to look into that for them. But right now, we're not set up for that. We don't have anything like that. Are we? Yeah, we don't have anything set up for that right now. Which is pretty interesting. Okay. Hello, Leo. Thank you for joining us. Um, Riley CD CD5, my good friend Riley, compared me to others, is saying, "What do you think about a third gen Accord hatch? Would you put an H22 in it? If not, what motor?" Oh, that's really interesting. H22 is a good if I'm going to stay fairly factory, or if I'm just going to bolt on a turbo. But if I wanted to go really nice modification, Leo says hi. Um, I would use the engine that I love, which is the F22A. It's cost-effective, has tons of potential, has a lot better um, valve angles compared to H22, and that's the limitation. Because of the radical valve angle in H22, you cannot put very large camshafts in. But with F22A, you can put up to 600 lift, which is pretty nice, and that gives you tons of power. So that being said, that's what we tend to do. And that's what I would recommend. In a hatch, F22A all day. That's why I run. And I have a lot of success with it, and it's very plentiful. You can find them. They're in Odysseys, they're in Accords, they're in Prelude, base Preludes, they're everywhere. It's pretty nice. Okay. Question from Giant Rider 82. Giant Rider 82. He says, I just got into autocross and okay. would like your opinion on a supercharged versus turbo setup mm. versus all motor mm. pros and cons on an FA5. Okay, so on the FA5, you have. Three different type of opportunities. You want boosted, supercharged, or NA. So it really depends on what you want. NA, I've seen some NA cars put down some good numbers at the track and do extremely well and a very low maintenance. Turbocharging is really fantastic because it gives you the capability of having variable power across the board in different gears, so on and so forth. It gives you the potential to go up and down in power without changing many components, which is pretty nice. Superchargers are linear. They treat your cars like a large natural aspirated setup, no lag whatsoever, very linear. The challenge with NA is ceiling in terms of power potential. Um, if you still push it more and more and more, your reliability goes down as you make more and more power, so you're using atmospheric pressure to your advantage, and that's a challenge. Supercharging requires energy to turn the compressor, so you're taking horsepower to make horsepower, and many times that robs Efficiency. You can get as much as a 70 horsepower drain in a pretty decent sized supercharger which could be used towards propelling your car forward and making you faster. So that could be a challenge. And above and beyond that you have belts which can stretch, belts which can slip, and you have no control over boost per gear. Turbocharging gives you all the advantages of boost per gear and modulation and being able to do some cool stuff and sounds fantastic but you can experience lag. Even with today's technology there's a little lag with turbocharged applications. But the best of all worlds, in my opinion, where we're using wasted energy to compress air, I love turbocharging. That's what I tend to use on most of my cars, you know. So yeah, B16 2, B16 A2, yep. I would do a turbo. It depends on what you're doing. I just love turbo stuff. It's really good. I love the challenge of NA, but I want to go fast. You know, going faster is much easier with turbocharging, which is pretty nice. Hello, Jordan. Good seeing you. 
Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you have an MR2 spider. Where are they to, to GZ? Uh, where are they to? I don't quite understand the question. But if you ask me what I recommend, um, some heavy modifications. <laughs> Turbocharging, big turbos, engine management. It depends on what you want to do. So if you tell me what the goal of the MR2 is, I can point you in a better direction, which is pretty nice. Um, proper tuning of a Turbo D, AM Finley for proper tuning. It gives you the benefits of a full motorsport ECU at a sportsman price, which I like. So you have all the features and accoutrements of a $10,000, $15,000 ECU with the speed that's even better than many of those ECUs, but at a cost that's like, you know, twelve to $1,500, which is pretty nice. And you have fail safes galore. Fail safe for fuel pressure, oil pressure, knock, wide band, feedback, you name it. It's pretty nice. I, I love it very much. Um, Island Soul says, my main shot bearings are going out in my ITRB series gearbox. It's an HTB H23 swap. Being now that I have to take my training apart, any way that gearing you would recommend for more drivability? It depends on what you're doing. Yes, I can recommend quite a bit. Gear speed has quite a bit for you. But it depends. The gearing can be tailored to the type of driving. Are you road racing? Are you street driving? Are you uh, drag racing? And one thing I want you to look into is, uh, Island Soul, your HTB. We are the ones who create those kits. Um, I had the honor of developing the first gearbox to engine combination for drag racing using a different gearbox and engine. And then I did it with a D to um, or H to D and then create the H to B and then have my friends from Evolution, which are part of that company, create some for the public and then people start knocking us off. But what we noticed with some of the knockoffs is that the alignment wasn't very good. The alignment of the engine to gearbox and what happens when your alignment's off you eat up main bearings in the engine and bearings in the gearbox so um, if you have one of the BC Moto or Evolution ones they are lined up perfectly by laser if you have one of these other companies I don't know that could be one of your problems so I don't know um, D to B I will not be doing that because um, there's not much demand for it I didn't good so I have to create where there's demand it takes a lot of resources to create these products but a DTB is not just something that we get much demand for, so I won't be creating that. I'm so sorry. You know. Okay, what else do we have, Ari? Another AJ question. AJ has one more. What would be the largest displacement possible from a water-cooled Porsche six-cylinder when stroked and bored out to the max? And what do you think is the highest achievable power from the M96 and 97 on 91 NA or boosting without the NA? The challenge, AJ, with the M96, M97 engines in displacement is the cradle that the crankshaft sits in. That cradle limits the throw of the crank. And by limiting the throw of the crank, it also limits how large a rod you can put in there or how much sweep you can get from the rod. So if I had to take an educated guess, I would say a 4.7, maybe close to a 4.8 is the max you can probably do, and that's really pushing things with bore and stroking, trying to use maybe offset grinding as a way to get away with it. So instead of increasing the throw significantly by having it get closer to the edges of the cage where the crank sits in, you could offset grind using smaller journals and having the rod come further in to pull the pistons in further. That way getting more displacement per cylinder and going as big in the bore you can maybe even offset the bore slightly, you can probably get to 4.7, 4.8. That'd be, that'd be pretty easy. For power potential, that's very hard to tell because um, I don't foresee a ch on 91 octane, that's what he said, huh? You can possibly, 91 octane, with the right amount of flow, oh, 91, that's tough. I have to think about this, AJ. Um, I have to think about this. I would say to the wheels, probably 525, a little bit over 500. And that's really pushing things on 91. Very big camshafts, won't have much of any bottom end. For boost, oh, the sky's the limit. Uh, I think the limit on the boost will not be the head flow or how much air we can get in is the integrity of the components, especially, you know, the casings um, are held together um, 
and the heads go all the way through into the casing to the cage. So I can foresee at certain boost levels the head starting to lift because of stretch, which could be a challenge. So I'm sorry it took me a while, but I'm just going through this in my mind, building this very quickly, trying to see what potential challenges we can have. So um, can we make 200 per cylinder? Yes. Can we make 300 per cylinder? Yes. Can we make 400 per cylinder? Now we're starting to push things where we'll start finding fair areas, I'm very sure. And plus drivetrain is going to be really interesting as well. So I appreciate your questions, AJ. It really gets my cogwheels going. I appreciate that very much. Um, so um, Alf Ghani is asking, hi, can you give some explanation about the camshaft load separation angle? I found some engines with tight load separation angles make good power and sometimes wide load separation good power. Can you explain the factor affecting this? I won't have to. Um, Alif, I'll give you the condensed version of this because your question alone can spark an entire hour of interaction. So the lobe separation, as the name implies, is where you have the intake, let's say with my hand here and the exhaust, my hand here, and the angle separation is what occurs like this. So when you have a really wide one, you have very small overlap. And when you have a very close one, you have a lot of overlap. Now, ideally, for emissions, great activity in terms of idle quality, you want to have a wider lobe separation because what that does it makes the dynamic compression go up very, 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 very much and does very well for breathing capability and efficiency. But as you go up in RPM, closer to peak torque and post peak torque, you want to close that lobe separation angle and create more overlap. It allows for what is known as inertia supercharging, where you have an exhaust system doing a great job in scavenging the exhaust and the key to making power is getting clean air with the appropriate amount of fuel in it. So doing that separation, you can literally have inertia supercharging where the air can go through the intake and take out any of the exhaust that's from the previous cycle and give you more power. And that happens not when you have a wide lobe separation with minimal, with minimal uh, overlap, it's when it's closer together, which is pretty nice. So that gives you a lot of good power. And then when you go up in a high RPM, you may wind that just a little bit. So it's just allowing the engine to breathe differently. It also has a very, very, very profound effect on static compression. So you can get away, and this is one of my tricks, with a very, very, very narrow lobe separation angle and high compression. It allows you to eat your kick and have it too. And what's happening is that since you have so much overlap, your static compression or dynamic doesn't seem extremely high, and you can get away with allowing some breathability without pre-ignition, without having to fuel um, pre-ignite due to pressure that's happening in the combustion chamber, which is pretty nice. So long story short, Yes, Ari. No okay, Ari's giving me this look like, I don't know if I'm in trouble or not. No, no, no. But um, loop separation angle is just a very clever way of, of overlap, increase, and decrease. And it plays a huge role in torque production, efficiency, and so on and so forth. There's a lot more in terms of that, because I'd love to be able to draw a full curve for you in terms of uh, the auto cycle and how the camshaft plays a role and how kind of, what kind of power you can get from that. But like I said that's a full class, and maybe that's something we should do, Ari, is to be able to do that. Because I want, I definitely want to do a class on oils, and maybe I'll do a class on camshaft design, which can help a lot of people understand that even further, which would be pretty nice. So I hope that helps quite a bit. Um, the Honda Legend 3.5, no, I've not had much experience with that adding good. I see you're asking that. Um, Dark Wrath, you had some questions about my uh, D series engine, the one that I broke a bunch of records with. A lot of people may want to benefit from that. So yeah, by all means, write to us at sales at bcmo.com and maybe next week, Tuesday, we can discuss it so everyone can learn from that because I love sharing what I did with that. Um, he has a 23 Accord, wants to make 400 horsepower. It's very possible. Very, very possible. It can be done. Um, would I recommend a turbo D16 in your four-wheel drive wagon? No, I would recommend that. If anything, I would recommend using a Z6 engine with the VTEC and the potential and using one of our camshafts. Hello, Alex. And then boosting that, that'd be very nice. That'd be very, very good. Okay. How are we doing on questions, Ari? Three more to go. Three more to go. Okay, almost there. How are we doing on time? Oh my God, the time is flying. Okay. We have to continue before Instagram cuts us off. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Just Norris now. Has, Just Norris now. Has a question re uh, referencing to the Blue 911. Okay. This wouldn't happen to be the same car I saw at an Arizona no-fly zone about four years ago. Yes, it was. It's the very same 911 that I took to the, um, what was it? We were in Gila Bend, Arizona. 
with no fly zones. Very same car. And if you want to see the performance and how she did, she did very well. Go on the BC Motor YouTube page, put in BC Motor Porsche, and you'll see it racing in the half mile. And it did very well for a car that was built in 1975 and not very aerodynamically sound. I'm very proud of her. Hello, Daz. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate that. My pleasure, Adeng Good. Have a good evening indeed. Okay, two more before they cut us off. Our time is almost gone. Okay. Question comes from Gang Member 310. Gang Member 3. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, Gang Member 310, I'm going to ask you a question. You have a very interesting screen name. Oh, have a good one as well, CP. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate that. Okay. He's asking 996 Turbo or 997C2? It depends. If you want the comfort, the 997s have a beautiful interior, very comfortable, and improved air conditioning and cruise comforts. Steering feels improved as well. Externally, it looks very attractive. But if you want access, and I need to put this up, if you want access to one of the most underrated supercars on the planet right now, it's the 996 Turbo. You can't go wrong with that. I mean, for high 30s, low 40s, you can get an absolutely spectacular supercar with an engine that's capable of 700 horsepower stock, all-wheel drive, Porsche's stability management control, beautiful creature comforts, not so ugly front end, nice wide body, it's absolutely spectacular. It's just, 996 Twin Turbo is the way to go. I actually sold mine recently because a customer came in and made an offer. I actually regret it. Yes, Alex is absolutely correct. The 996 Twin Turbo is the best bang for the buck. And we had one here recently, I'll probably post it up tomorrow, that uh, just a baseline with some simple mods um, made well over 500 wheel, which is pretty nice. And that's 500 wheel on pump gas. And you compare that to, let's say, someone buying an NSX, an old school 91 NSX, and putting a turbo kit on top of that. By the time you spend that money, you'll be definitely in the 50s, 60s. But you can get this 996 with just a turbo upgrade, intercooler upgrade, and an Infiniti or Flash, and boom, you're there. Which is pretty nice. So um, it's, it's fantastic. I, I love those cars. The 996 Twin Turbo is the way to go. Very underrated. Thank you so much, Envy. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you so much. GZ, appreciate that much. It's always, especially since you love Boost. Hello, four door sedan. Okay, I think we have one more. Our last AJ question. Last AJ question. Which setup do you personally prefer and would make the most amount of power with, with the Porsche nine? I'm sorry, Porsche M ninety six ninety seven NA engine or any other engine you've worked on and why? Short stroke high rev or long stroke high torque? That. That's a lot of variables. Um, AJ, that's a lot of variables. Um, if you ask me to choose between those two, I uh, actually almost combine. So here's the here's a perfect thing for me. I um, mean, you know this high flow head application. I love the flat sixes because they're very balanced. I'm a huge advocate of long rod engines because of its lack of uh, stressors when it comes to side loading of the piston. I'm big on high compression. I'm big on big bores, I'm big on deshrouding valves, I'm big on head flow. I don't like RPM because I know what happens to valve train at 8, 9, 10, 12,000 RPMs and it does reduce longevity even with the coatings and oils we have today. So if I could, I will stay in the lower RPM band but many times when you want to make power, especially NA, you have to buzz the engines. It's about airflow. So I will find a good compromise that can give us good longevity and power. So that would be the ideal engine. Yes, it would be a flat 6, dare I say a flat 8. Can there be a flat 10, flat 12? Those would be very good because you can place the engines in a very low area for excellent center of gravity and also have the opportunity to do wonderful things, especially in terms of rod ratios, strength, cages, flow, heads, coatings. It's just so much. Um, Dark Knight, you want me to explain about uh, deshrouding valves. So here's what I'm going to do. I just have a warning on my screen now. You guys can see this. But I have a warning that I have 24 seconds remaining before this cuts off. So that being said, I'm going to go out, come back in, and I will answer your question about deshrouding valves as well. Thank you, Rinkara. And um, Flat 6, let's talk about that as well. So Flat 6, your question about modifying the 996 turbos and definitely... The question about the shrouding. Let's come back in. Talk to you soon, guys. Take care. Cheers. 447. You want me to continue recording on this? Um, sure. Let's do that. Let's leave, let's leave it going. Okay. Let's leave that going. And we're still good here. So let's come back in. And.
the airplane, airplane mode worked very well. For those of you on YouTube, I had to do airplane mode because people kept calling me during my sessions, which is pretty interesting. So, welcome back, guys. I'm here again, here at BC Moto um, with my cool wig. Look at this. You gotta leave this on for the session. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> don't judge me. Look at this. This wig is actually misbehaving. I don't know what this is right here, but it's pretty good. Hello, guys. Welcome back. Quartz in session. We're here. Hello, Jeremiah. Hello, Kyle. Hello, Rodrigo. Hello, guys. I'm here at Bisumoto. Missing my gavel. I need to get a gavel. You do. And a table so I can hit something on the table. Hello, Orpheus. Hello, Dark Wife. Hello, Flex Six. Wear this driving around. You know, I'm going to wear this to the next uh, Lutical, <laughs> which would be pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, this is not aerodynamic at all. Um, hello, Air Cooled. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I do work on 3S GTs. I do. Um, hello, guys. Peter. Okay, I'm going to take this off. All right. Okay. On a serious note, the question came earlier on about disrotting valves and why that's important and what does that mean. So, the key to making power in cars, not just aspirated, boost, you name it, is to get as much air as physically possible in the engine. Of course, with the appropriate amount of fuel added to it for ideal combustion and heat. Because as I mentioned all the time, this is something I talk about all the time, engines are nothing but glorified energy converters. It takes the chemical energy from the oxygen in air, which is about 20% or so, 21%, and the caloric content of the fuel. So you have those two compounds there, those two opportunities for chemical energy that exist. They're released via combustion. And when combustion happens, you now have this great heat that occurs, which is now the chemical energy turned into heat energy. That heat energy is now converted to do work on the piston by pushing down the piston, which is then translating the up and down movement to rotational movement via the crankshaft, and we now have mechanical energy. So we have chemical to heat to mechanical energy. Now, the one thing that impedes all that air getting into your combustion chamber to do work via combustion is inhibition by the valves. So you have the valves that exist in the head. I wish I had a head here to show you. And anything that could prevent the air from flowing around that valve is a, is a challenge. Eric, can you give me a valve by any chance? Sure. Just pull me any valve. This should be right there. So I'll, she'll give me a valve and I'll show it to you. Okay. And then the air has to go around the valve and if anything gets in the way or blocks it, it prevents air from getting a combustion chamber, which translates into less power, you know? Um, yeah, I find it challenging as well, Jock. I did it for many years, and there's nothing more gratifying than building a nice NA setup that sounds great and spanks on boosted cars. But you have to be careful. There are a lot of fast boosted cars out there, too, so which is pretty nice. It's not really fair because you only, as NA, have access to atmospheric pressure, which at sea level is 14.7 PSI. And then if someone has 14.7 PSI or 15 PSI on their race engine, or their street engine, or any boosted engine, they have twice the amount of power potential as you in terms of boost, sort of pressure. Twice the amount of power potential, which is crazy, you know. Um, top end versus low end boost, it depends on what you're doing. If you're drag racing, half mile stuff, top end boost, you can have a lot of fun. If you're about light to light, road racing, drifting, low end boost is very nice, which is pretty good. The best would be the best of both worlds. Valve jobs, three angle versus five angle, let's talk about that. Um, because to be honest with you, a radius valve angle is the best. Something that doesn't obey certain angles but has a nice radius. But between the two, um, the five angle gives you a much better flow for all things being equal. But also the less opportunity for heat transfer because you have a smaller surface for the valve to interact. Um, and the valve seat does more than just seal. It allows heat to get transferred from the valve to the head, which is pretty nice. Helps put warping at bay and all that fun stuff, which is pretty good. So I'm waiting for Ari to come back with a valve. Um, did you find one, Ari? Okay, guys, hang tight. Let me grab a valve. It'll just take me a quick second. I'll show you. I don't exactly. Is this in your box, the valve? Sorry guys, I'm back. Sorry about the delay. Hopefully I didn't lose mo most of you guys. 
Okay, you see here, yay, awesome. Okay, so this is a valve, and the valve goes in the head, and you have that, and it sits on the seat. So this valve area, the key to making power, this is an intake valve, pretty large one, one, of, one for one of my race engines, one of my F22As. And the air just comes through down the valve stem and goes around. Now, the head many times will have material, because it's a combustion chamber head that's mass produced, would have material very close to this, which is made of aluminum in the combustion chamber. If you gradually deshroud or take the material away through porting or clean up combustion chamber, the head now has opportunity to experience improved flow, especially at low and high lifts, therefore allowing for more air to enter combustion chamber and with the appropriate amount of fuel, you make more power. You can also deshroud combustion chambers um, or valves by having a larger bore because if the bore is very close when the valve opens, it can also prevent air from flowing nicely. If you poof the bore, the bore away, move it away a little bit more from the valve, you also have more flow potential. And even with pistons, especially doing overlap, if you have a big dome, that dome can inhibit not only flame propagation, but also flow doing overlap. So if you slightly, and I've done this on pistons, just shroud the valve pocket, you make more power too. There's so many ways, so many cool things, which is pretty nice, you know. Um, I purchased Total Spec B. Those are actually pretty decent cams for your Integra Type R. Do I recommend stock retainers or which ones? No. Um, the stock retainers are relatively heavy. I would recommend titanium ones, and we have them in stock. So you can give Ari a call. She'd be more than happy to help you out. Um, so, I believe my friend Flat6 came in and asked about the um, 996 Twin Turbo. What are the quickest, best applications for improvement in power? What mods would I recommend? First, in a cool upgrade. The factory ones, not only are they very inefficient, they do a marginal job in cooling the intake temps. The end caps, the end tanks tend to fracture after some years. So um, our friends at Turbinex, they have an upgrade. You can find upgrades from them, from other companies that are very reliable, that have higher fin density, thicker cores, better cooling, which is nice. I like the Turbinex one because it literally bolts on to your factory end caps. So you can just Take off your hoses, put them in, no adapters required, no other, other additional uh, sections for failure of boost, which is pretty interesting, you know? So that being said, that's the first opportunity for improvement. Secondly, turbos. The factory turbos are very limited. Um, Turbinex has a TNX uh, 20, which allows for a T25 application, and we do modifications to the factory manifolds to allow for that to be used. Um, gives you a nice amount of spool, nice amount of cross-section area, good spool, very good spool. You retain factory spool, but a lot more power potential. Billet compressors, I think the, there's a very nice 40, uh, I think it's a 46 or 48 millimeter extrusor on the exhaust wheel. So you eat your kick and have it too, more power potential, very fast spool. And that's another good opportunity for improvement as well. And then last but not least, an engine management solution. I like the AM Infinity, it bolts on. And you have to check with your local authorities to see if that's allowed in your area. But you can do everything from anti-lagging to full knock control to boost control, you name it. And upgrading your injectors as well. Anywhere from a, uh, 750 to 1000 cc. And voila, that's it. You will now have the power potential to make 500 plus wheel horsepower with a 996 turbo. Very simple. Stock pump, stock suspension, stock gearbox. And after some time, you have to upgrade your clutch, which is pretty nice. Which is pretty nice. Good evening, Akmal. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I think I saw a good question from Devil. Simple things matter since this is my girls, my girls to life feed. I have an EcoBoost Mustang. No, I don't hate you for EcoBoost Mustang. Um, I still have the Mustang here. It was not enjoyable, Devil. So the Mustang EcoBoost is here. I still have the engine. I actually put it back to factory. It's one of the cars that, honestly, I was not happy with. We showed the power potential. She was a, I'll be honest with you, she was a true dyno queen. Um, the Mustang in factory form, I didn't like because the boost comes up very quickly. So you feel this power rush and then it falls off rapidly. I'm like, what is up with this? You put on a dyno, you understand. It doesn't have good power potential in terms of RPM. We fixed that with heads, camshafts from Ford Racing, sleeve the block, custom pistons from Trom. Gonigo did the sleeving. Great job with that. And now the power potential was there. And we put a big 76 millimeter turbo and it just wasn't enjoyable. It made the power of the dyno 901 to the wheels, which is nice on E85. And I used an AM Infinity and I retrofitted uh, port injection into it, which I had to do because there was nothing commercially available at the time when we built this that can allow us that much power potential, but it was just really laggy and I, I don't like laggy setups. It was great project to show the power potential of the EcoBoost Mustang, 
but super laggy. I felt I feel that car would be very fun at about 500 horsepower. 500 horsepower, maybe about you know 350 to 400 foot pounds of torque. That'd be a fun fun application. I feel like today with all the people that embrace that platform, there are opportunities out there. I think Turbonetics even has a singular turbo that bolts on that can allow you to get that power potential in a brilliant application, which is superior to the factory, which is pretty nice. And there are many other people out there also who have the opportunities for flashes, which would be pretty nice too as well. So thank you so much for that question, and I definitely don't hate you at all, you know. Um, yes, Mosien is asking, do I recommend tuning his 98 Type R with uh, E85, yes, it would help reliability because the tuning window is now wider and it allows you the opportunity to make more power without challenges of detonation that you may see. Uh, Fast Lane, this is the European uh, Cup from UK, Porsche Cup, which is pretty nice, playing my waiting room here. And right here I have uh, some wheels from Carbon Revolution, which is pretty nice, and some t-shirts here behind me as well. Um, a Fox RS, maybe, but maybe not. Ford is moving away, I don't know if you heard that AJ here in the United States, I think a majority of the world, they are now moving away from vehicles, from cars, from sedans and coupes, and focusing primarily on trucks. And we had an opportunity to talk to guys at Hoonigan last, last uh, week or so, and you may end up seeing Ken Block even um, hooning around in trucks, opposed to vehicles. So I think in the, U in the UK, you may still have Focus RSs going on, but here in the US, it's going to be a thing of the past, unfortunately. My pleasure, Mosien. My pleasure indeed. Um, hello, underdog. Good seeing you indeed. Thank you for joining this afternoon. So I came back in, guys, after a beautiful hour um, of a BC Mode Tech Tuesday to come and answer some of the questions that were coming in. So um, I think my time is up here with my, look at that, uh, podcasting, which you can listen to on uh, iTunes, Anchor, and Public Radio, which is pretty nice. We'll be coming soon, so you can listen to that at your liberty. Hello, Ricky. But I'm going to call it a day. Grab a bite to eat, enjoy, and you guys can hit me up here on Bismoto. And if you have any further questions, let me know. I look forward to seeing you guys all next week. Take care. Cheers.